humanity should change. I do. I totally do. In fact, I think that's the beauty of Christianity, when it does change and when it does evolve. In fact, that's maybe what we mean when we say we have a living gospel. I mean, things that live, they breathe, they open up, they change, they grow, they evolve, right? But I was talking to this pastor last week and he said, no way, I don't think Christianity is supposed to change at all. It's supposed to be the same today as it was yesterday and we need to protect it in a way that it stays the same for tomorrow. I don't know, how do you view it? And I just don't see it that way. For me, I just, for me, it's just not intellectually or historically honest if I pretend that Christianity hasn't changed through the ages, through the century. Of course it has. Um, it's always changed and evolved. How we interpret the Bible has always changed and evolved. And that doesn't mean there's something wrong with it. That's everything I think that's right with it. Now I think what ultimately changes Christianity and has faith evolve is two wonderful things and they are empathy and wisdom. By empathy I mean this, that we may have a certain belief system or a certain religious structure, but when we start to feel empathy and love and compassion for people in a way that connects us with their hurt or has us understand their trueness. Uh, certain things we held onto, our beliefs or from our perspective, they may end up changing. And what changed those beliefs or those things that we would hold onto is suddenly our love and empathy for people. I don't think that's anti-Christian. I think that's quintessentially Christian. This is exactly what Jesus modeled. There was a certain belief structure he came into, and he said, yeah, that is what we used to believe. Yeah, that, those are uh, the practices we held onto, but we're not doing that anymore. And he just illustrated his love and empathy to people. The other thing that changes and evolves Christianity is wisdom. As the human experience grows and opens up and evolves, things we used to think we don't think anymore. Perspectives that we used to have we no longer hold on to. Why? Because we've woken up, we've grown wiser. Uh, certain empathies, uh, Empathy um, moves us to change uh, things we believe and hold onto. So empathy and wisdom, you know, it, it changes our spiritual lives. And for a lot of us, it, it just doesn't seem empathetic, loving, and wise to hold on to a specific version of faith that we are supposed to export to the world and convert everybody to, especially when that version of faith mostly was born from the Reformation and in the last hundred years, it just doesn't seem empathetic or wise. It doesn't seem empathetic and wise when we hold on to a Christian spirituality that pronounces love and yet we exclude our gay friends, our trans, friends, um, a faith that doesn't empower women in a, in an egalitarian way that allows them to be equal and gain the opportunities that men have, that just doesn't seem empathetically loving or wise. And it, it just doesn't seem empathetic and wise when um, our faith is about proclaiming and making it a mission to take a rigid, formulaic view of a spiritual life uh, when 
It seems more wise, more loving and empathetic that Christian spirituality is about healing the world. So what if Christian spirituality was less about adherence to a specific doctrine or protecting certain beliefs and it was more about opening up with empathy and the scriptures uh, lead us to a place of greater wisdom where we see things differently, where we feel things differently, where Christian spirituality, more than beliefs and doctrine, is about empathetic love and awakening wisdom. I think that would change everything. And for me, that's what Christianity and Christian spirituality is about. I think it's always changed and I think it will always need to continue to change through empathy and through wisdom. The Greek word for wisdom is the beautiful word Sophia. We named our daughter Sophia, which is a, means wisdom. Lionel and Nicole wrote this beautiful song about wisdom called Sophia. And as they come sing it, and as you watch and listen, make it more than observational, make it more than transactional. Open up your mind, open up your heart, soul, and spirit. Breathe in empathy, breathe in wisdom, and may you experience the presence of God. She was there at the beginning, formed in ancient times, when earth and sea were just a distant dream. Before mountains were established, before fountains were secured, and boundaries set limits to the sea. Those with eyes perceive And those with understanding seek her ways So fear She shouts in gentle whispers in the streets and marketplace. Above the noisy crowd, she's crying out. Fools alone despise her, wise souls recognize her and prize her beyond any selfish gain. Understand and seek her ways So fear Come lead us And come free us So fear From our blindness and indifference Our folly and ignorance She is waiting She
Sophia From my blindness and indifference Our folly and ignorance Lady Wisdom Come teach us Sophia Sophia Hi everyone, I'm Wendy. Welcome to Sparrow Day. I'm sure you've heard it takes a village to raise a child. Well, I have two, and I am so blessed that Sparrow Day has been part of mine. The three of us have received so much love and support from this non-judgmental community, and I'm grateful. So today I pray that you, wherever you are in life, you also feel loved and supported. We run wild through every season Lit a fire to warm the world A love so easy to believe in You're saying I'm your favorite girl church that is rethinking, reimagining, and reforming Christianity for the 21st century. You're drawn to that. So whether you're here in Nashville or some other place, I just want to welcome you. Oh, I'm David Perez. I'm the lead minister here. So welcome, welcome, welcome. You know that forgiveness is one of the center points of Christianity. Anybody that is well aware of Christian theology and Christian history, Christian spirituality goes, okay, forgiveness is a center point of it. So though we may easily know that, if I were to say, hey, are you familiar with the scriptures, the Old Testament, the New Testament, where forgiveness is talked about, uh, that is a whole other thing. So, though it may be easily known, understanding forgiveness, experiencing forgiveness, 
well, that's complicated and nuanced and at times difficult. Why? Because we've been hurt for real. Uh, we've been wounded for real. We've been betrayed for real or we've been abused for real. And so when real things come, just because we may easily know that Christian spirituality is about forgiveness, or one of the things it's about is forgiveness. Experiencing it is difficult. You know, in the Old Testament, not a lot of interpersonal forgiveness is talked about. In the Old Testament, when forgiveness is talked about, it's much about a national forgiveness. It's about um, God, the parent, forgiving the child, which is a wayward nation, and them reattaching uh, through forgiveness and um, in a national way. I suppose if you saw the, or if you know the, the story at the end of Genesis about Joseph, the wonderful Joseph story, you could say, well, there's interpersonal forgiveness hinting there, and that's for sure. But I think that story is mostly about um, uh, hurt and um, uh, r relational restoration. But by the time we get to the New Testament, um, oh man, when Jesus talks about forgiveness, it's all interrelational. It's all interspiritual. And the Apostle Paul and the other New Testament writers do the same. And so forgiveness is one of those things that is known, well known, but what is it? And how do you do it? And why should we forgive? I don't always think that can be so easily answered. This is where ministerially I'm a contrarian. I don't think there's one simple answer as to what forgiveness is or why we need to forgive or how we get there. It can be as nuanced and complex as the hurt and the amount of people uh, that experience it. But one thing that is a common experience is, is, is that none of us can go through life without being hurt. All of us have been hurt in a way that we are holding on to something, and it's hard for us to let go of something. That's a very, very common experience. We even know, we, all we have to do is watch an old Oprah show or watch a goofy Lifetime movie, and we even know that that harboring hurts and resentment and not forgiving, we even know that this is just not medically, scientifically good for us, right? We know that. We know it raises heart rates and stress. We know it lowers mortality rates when we harbor resentment and can't forgive. But even though we may know what our faith, what is important to our faith, and even though we may know what's not good for our health, our own souls know that when we can't forgive someone or something, when we insist on holding on to something and letting go, uh, it's self-torturing, isn't it? It keeps us trapped in our past. It keeps us trapped in a very, our present hurtful thoughts, and it creates for us now a very rigid and narrow future for us. So we long to be people who forgive and to let go of grudges. Today I wanna to talk about three things that we actually need to release in order to help us move and navigate towards forgiveness. And um, I'll tell you what, what I've discovered about forgiveness, or I should say this, what I've discovered about life, life is constantly having to forgive someone all the time. People in life are always letting us down, not coming through. 
People often say insensitive things to us. Uh, people often don't come through or betray us. There are others who have been abused. So just living life is this constant confrontation of will I forgive or not forgive. And last week I talked about that, you know, one of the things that forgiveness isn't, it, it doesn't always mean that a relationship is restored. And I told, uh, I told a story about one of my own lifelong friends about reaching forgiveness, but not necessarily restoring a relationship. But forgiveness is often a restoration of relationships. And part of the journey there of restoring relationships through forgiveness, it is journeying to this place where you have done the inner work of being able to say, I think my relationship with you is more important to me and matters more than the rights or perspective I'm holding on to. But that's a journey. But here's where I'll also be contrarian as a minister. As much as we know what forgiveness is and even isn't, as much as we know it's bad for our health, but our own souls uh, don't want to be trapped by resentment and be freed by forgiveness, some of our own Christian teaching, some of our own Christian tutelage has not helped at all. In fact, some of our own Christian teaching has inflicted more damage. You see, when we reduce the scriptures, when we reduce our Christian faith to uh, the mere understanding of, you know, say it, pray it, obey it, uh, when we reduce it down to uh, rigid doctrines that don't evolve, or change with empathy and wisdom. Well, then what can happen is when we teach on forgiveness from that perspective, forgiveness when you've really been hurt or hurt again by somebody, is this on-demand thing from you. We demand of you, if you're going to be a good Christian, we demand of you your benevolence and forgiveness. Sometimes that's even been manipulated and used against you by someone who has hurt you and hurt you again, right? They're wallowing in their own guilt and they go, hey, you're supposed to forgive me to be a good Christian. You're supposed to forgive me always and forever, 70 times 7, right? And so when we have such a rigid, simplistic um, not nuanced or complex understanding of forgiveness. We just do more damage with our teaching. Another way we do more damage of our teaching is how we teach the supernatural with hyperbole and in such a, a hyperbolic way, exaggerated, not real way. So when we teach that, you know, you will, um, uh, you know, if you pray and ask for God to help you forgive, you'll be infused and invaded with this supernatural Holy Spirit force that will fill you with compassion and empathy and the ability to supernaturally forgive with an agape love. So you believe that and we teach that. So you pray, God, help me to forgive the spouse who betrayed me and betrayed me again. God, help me to forgive the business partner who stole and took from me. Help me to forgive the friend who stabbed me in the back and stabbed me again. So you prayed for this because this was the sincerity of the heart. And this is how spirituality was taught to you, that the spirit will come upon you and just give you this supernatural ability so you do it and do it and like some superhero comic book you're expecting to be filled with this it doesn't happen you can't forgive the spouse the business partner the friend the thing and it just continues to do more spiritual damage, just heap more spiritual guilt and shame because you think you're a lousy, you're lousy at being a Christian and you must not really believe this stuff or it must not 
really matter. And so we do more damage even with our spiritual teaching. And I just don't think forgiveness is that way at all. I just, I don't think that's how the scriptures uh, teach it. In fact, when we teach forgiveness that way about this hyperbolic supernatural power uh, coming over us that we just wait on and believe in, it actually leads to self-abandonment. And if there's anything Jesus taught in his interactions with people, he empowered them. Self-abandonment, I don't think, is part of deep Christian spirituality. It's also about a trust dismissal. And when we teach in such a hyperbolic way, uh, the Christian faith, and especially forgiveness, becomes very observational and transactional. But Christian spirituality is not observational. It's not transactional. It's participational. It's transcendent. It's God and us infused together. It's in partnership with you. It's things that you, barriers you need to work through, things that you need to release. This is the spiritual life. So let me talk about um, three practices, three practices of things we need to release that can continue to move our spiritual lives towards a deeper understanding, but most of all, a deeper experience of forgiveness. So forgiveness, as I said, is a practice, and one of the things you and I need to practice is practice releasing someone. Practice releasing the person or the people that hurt you. Folks, here's what's true about us. Here's what's scary true about us. It is so seductive to hold on to our hurts. It is so addictive to not let go of something or someone uh, who's hurt us. It is a rush. And for, especially at the beginning, oh man, it feels good because it gives us a, a, a sense of legitimate, right? It legitimizes our hurt. Hey man, I'm the one that's been hurt and you're the one that hurt me. I'm the victim here, you're the perpetrator. And what becomes so seductive and addictive is holding on to that so our hurts are legitimized. Though that might be understandable, and we get it, uh, it's not uh, helpful um, when we hold on to this rush. So there are several ways that we can release someone and release the person who hurt us. One of the ways I began to spoke about, speak about it last week, it's just becoming more aware. Become more aware of how you feel versus fixating on the thoughts you have about someone. Become more aware of the internal work you need to do versus the external thing or faults of someone or this thing that happened. It's, you know what, part of the rush of, um, and the seduction of holding on to our hurts, man, it always makes things very tidy and clean and it always aids in our own self-protection. Why? Because I focus on them instead of myself. But true forgiveness experienced is not letting go of that thing outside. It's doing the internal work, the vulnerability where you release this thing from the inside. And so when you can be more vulnerable about how you feel, more vulnerable about the hurt you've had, more vulnerable about the barriers like 
the doormat barrier I spoke about last week, the um, backfire barrier I spoke about last week, the fear barrier I spoke about last week. When you are more aware of those things, how it, there are obstacles to forgiveness, then you begin to awaken. It helps you release uh, someone. And so just hold on to the process of forgiveness is always through vulnerability, never a fixation or feeding a narrative. It's vulnerability, not feeding a narrative or feeding your faults. I want you to see this passage in Luke 17 that Christ teaches. If a brother or sister changes the way they think and act, forgive him. Now let's stop there for a moment. Look at that. If somebody has hurt you in a way that then they are floored by the humility of it, they are enveloped um, with how they've hurt you, and they are committed to going on a journey themselves of restoration, transforming and changing the way they think about what they did to you or acted in a way towards you, well, then trust is building up. And what Jesus is saying is, well, now it's healthy to forgive them. You forgive them. Why? Because they're willing to change. And then look at the second part in verse 4. Even if they wrong you seven times in one day and come back to you seven times and say, I'm sorry, I'm attempting a new direction forgive them. So again, the assumption here is the perpetrator is actually humbled in this, doesn't want to further victimize you. They're actually seeking to change and transform. Then it is just healthy spiritually in every way to forgive them, to let them go. So who do you need to release? Who do you need to let go? What drug are you still feeding yourself to hold on to the the power and control you need to have? Because truly you were victimized by an imbalance of power. Oh, I know you were. But holding on to that and holding on to not releasing them is doing further damage to your own heart. So it's the practice of releasing someone. Here's the second practice and second release. It's the practice of releasing yourself. It's releasing the self-blame. Folks, continual and chronic self-blame upon yourself. Uh, This is a form of toxic abuse done by you against you. And it just further accentuates and highlights. uh, When you're involved in self-blame, it accentuates your inadequacies, real or imagined. And you just continue to self-punish yourself. And there are two ways to, to, to move through this. One of this is the inertia of taking responsibility. When you just can go, you know, I did that, I thought that, I hurt that. When you can just move towards your own pain, your own offense, and take responsibility, which takes a great deal of courage, spiritual courage. When you do that, this begins to help you release yourself. The second thing that helps you release yourself after taking responsibility is just self-love and self-care. It's continuing to give yourself self-love and self-care. When you think of the great command and the three things that Jesus asked us to love, that the Christian spirituality is about loving these three things. It's about having a loving attachment to God, and it's about having a loving attachment to your neighbor just the same way you have a loving attachment to yourself. It's about self-love. Self-love is never about narcissism. So Jesus taught self-love. The perennial tradition in most religions teaches the health of self-love. I love what the Buddha said. He said, you yourself, as much as anyone else in the entire universe, deserve 
your love and affection. This is exactly what Christ was teaching about love your neighbor as yourself. And so this need to be right, this need to avoid blame, actually has this boomerang effect that as long as you insist on being right and avoiding blame, it just helps you punish yourself more and more. In fact, uh, self-blame will always lead to toxic self-shame. And so as you move towards taking responsibility and just honestly saying, yeah, that was me. And as you are involved in self-care and self-love, this begins to navigate releasing yourself. Do you need to release yourself? Do you continue to punish yourself with just awful, torturous thoughts about yourself? It's time. It's time to release that. And it's time to treat yourself the same way God treats you. The same, it's, t- it's time to feel about yourself the same way God feels about you. Well, here's the last practice and the last practice of what you and I rele- need to release. And I'm going to admit that this one is contrarian. It may even be a bit weird. I can, I can own that. So not only do we need to practice releasing someone and practice releasing ourselves, we need to practice releasing the world. We need to practice forgiving life and forgiving the world. When Jesus was dying on the cross and when he still had some life and breath and words in him, as he was looking down on those who were torturing him and executing him, he prays a prayer to the God he loves and is attached to, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. It's as almost in that sense that Jesus was just releasing and forgiving life and that happens that crap and stuff happens in life our dreams don't come true the efforts we give um, towards our endeavors don't end up being successful or they fail people we hoped in Uh, don't come through. Something that we thought would bring us life and love collapsed or went away or divorced or died. A hope, a dream never happened. And so some of you have not released that. And how we navigate and move towards forgiveness is when we can just go life and all the crap that can happen, I just, I let it go, I release it. And if you don't like the word forgiveness, forgiving life, then that's okay, hold on to this word. Replace the word forgiveness with acceptance. It's like Jesus just had a full acceptance. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He just had an utter acceptance of this is what happens or this is what has been done to me. And he was able to release it. So the more you can practice releasing someone, releasing and forgiving yourself and releasing just a life wound and life hurt that was done to you for some inexplicable or maybe very explicable reason, the more you can practice releasing these things, you are on the road to navigating forgiveness. And you might be in a season where, you know, releasing someone and practicing these, practice is not a one-time thing. If you just have to do something once, it's not a practice. Practicing releasing someone, myself, in life, this is an ongoing thing. Why? Because 
life happens. People happen. Stuff happens. I don't know. I just think, to me, this gives me many hopes when I think of, okay, understanding the barriers that hurt me from last week to help me navigate forgiveness, understanding three things that I have to release. Oh my gosh, this makes not the spiritual life magical. It actually makes it naturally miraculous for me that God gets to transcend his presence with me and I get to participate in that. And through this journey, I grow and evolve through wisdom, through empathy. So before we go, let's, let's pray. And maybe we can begin to practice releasing. And maybe this week, each day, you can just become more aware and practice releasing someone who has hurt, hurt you, releasing yourself, releasing life. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, I pray that you would be with those who are just holding on to someone, someone who has hurt them deeply in a way that it's just, it's just hurting them. I pray that they would release this person by saying this person no longer has power over them. This person no longer has any kind of control over them. And I just pray that you would give them a strength for their own self-love, their own self-dignity. that you would just allow them to let go of feeding the narrative and the real narrative that hurt them. It's real. But to no longer keep feeding that, keep feeding the rightness or the victimness of which all might be true. But they would move towards the vulnerability of the hurt they feel, the wounds they feel, so they can navigate the barriers, so they can move towards self-dignity and strength to let go of this person. I just pray that they would release someone. God, I pray for those who are mired in self-blame that just creates deep, deep shame. I pray that they would see themselves as you see them, which is loved. And that they would just begin to practice greater self-forgiveness, self-compassion, and self-love. And that they would just move towards honesty and responsibility and just be able to humbly say, you know, I did that. I said that. I created that. I allowed that. And just knowing that the more they move towards the pain of honesty with themselves, that that will help them release themselves. And then God, I just pray for anybody that is mad at the world, mad at life. I just spoke to someone last week that is just mired in just being mad at the world, mad at how life went and they're just tortured. In fact, they've been tortured by it for years. God, I pray for anybody who is like that, that they would just release life, release free, you know, let it, you know, release life. And just let go of the world and the way it is and how it hurt them and help us all to move to just a greater acceptance of how life goes. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. May God's presence be very much with you. 
Sit there while I tell you just how beautiful you look tonight As if you haven't heard me say it about a hundred times You shake your head and look away I promise that I've tried my hardest to let go of this But every time I think about a world without you in it My life becomes a darker shade of gray Hey, hey, and all I wanna do is make you smile When darkness still ensues, I wanna be alive Whatever we go through, I'll make it worth your while Cause every minute and every hour On staring while I tell you that you're all I need And even though I know you know that I'm a fighting me I'm gonna keep on showing you 